Good evening, y'all, and welcome to preparation day number six. This is the sixth one of these that we've done. This is a weekly uh, gathering of all of us to sit together and ask questions and go over the weekly update here at Christ the Redeemer and be prepared for the Sunday liturgy coming up this weekend. Let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and loving God, who have called us all to yourself, we ask you, Lord, that you would bless us and stir in up in us the grace that you have called us to. We ask you, Lord, that you would protect us from all danger and adversity. Keep us close to your heart. Help us to receive the grace you wish to give us. Help us hear your voice. Help us learn to love each other as they deserve and as we would like to be loved. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Weekly update that came out at 5 o'clock this evening has three or four major points to it, uh, two of which are relatively new. You'll see that our youth formation, search for a youth formation coordinator has hit a little snag, and uh, we're just not going to be ready to say who that person is because we haven't uh, finalized that with, uh, with anybody, uh, which also means we're not ready to start doing registration for the fall semester as that usually includes what we're going to be doing as we go forward into the fall semester. Uh, that's not going to be all that new or different, especially since um, it looks like school, for our public school students at least, is going to be backed up from uh, until Labor Day. And uh, we're all being prepared to do things maybe a little more digitally than we would ordinarily, obviously doing things a lot more digitally than we would ordinarily do, but more likely to do uh, more things digitally than uh, we were maybe thought about uh, several months back. We are planning, we are developing a plan that's not, obviously that's not left off my radar. That's the biggest thing in my heart right now is, is finding us the right youth formation coordinator, uh, coordinator of youth formation. So you guys continue to pray for that. <clears throat> ask the Lord help send us the right person for that job. Uh, we promised that we would have a confirmation practice date and time before August 1st, and we won't be gathering again together until after August 1st. So it appears that the best time for us to do practice for confirmation will be September 13th at 6 p.m. That is the usual time. That uh, That's the same time we will have we will have confirmation the following weekend. But uh, it, it will allow us uh, time to have everybody comfortable and confident going into that liturgy. Uh, this practice is primarily for students and sponsors. However, I would be shocked if the practice went on for a long time. So if you're dropping off your child for confirmation practice, you might want to stick around because I don't think it's going to be that, 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 that long. And then it might be helpful for you to, to stay for that. Anyway, this week on formed, uh, I've heard a lot about this. Uh, oh, before I say that, um, there is no code necessary to use Formed. Now, the easiest way for you to find their website, obviously, you can go to formed.org, or you can use our website and go to our Formed page under Media. There's, but there's no code to access it. Okay, as I was saying, I've heard a lot of good things about the St. Ignatius of Loyola movie, or Ignatius of Loyola is the title, but it's a movie about St. Ignatius of Loyola, who is the founder of the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus. Obviously, they... They're the source of inspiration for Loyola University in New Orleans and Jesuit High School in New Orleans. Um, but there, that movie is about the life of Ignatius of Loyola. I was talking with somebody earlier this week about how Ignatius is a very adventurous, sort of heroic kind of character. <clears throat> Probably harmonizes a little more than we would like to admit with Cajun culture because he was also particularly stubborn and, and, uh, and, and, and had a difficult life. So the Ignatius of Loyola movie is on there. It, it's supposed to be really good. Uh, there is a talk on there's a new talk on vocations. There's some new Nigerian hymns. There is a series on the Our Father that goes line by line through the Lord's Prayer. That will actually help you get more out of the Mass. And and specifically if you do things like pray the Rosary or the Liturgy of the Hours, any spot where you're going to be repeating the Our Father and making you, use of that as part of your personal prayer, it is very powerful to go through line by line that prayer so that they're not just empty words, but instead something that has a deep, deep meaning to you. Uh, on Formed Now this week, Monday there was How to Pray, Tuesday was Difficulties in Prayer, Wednesday was a Bible study on the Gospel of Matthew by, by Dr. Michael Barber, 
who is a fantastic, phenomenal scripture scholar. So he's on there. Then there is a, a talk on Can God Heal Human Division? And then finally there's a talk on the Feast of St. Ignatius of Loyola, which I'm sure is a wonderful follow-up to the movie if you should watch that. Rose to the occasion little update on our the slots that were, that were missing, the big open slots. We have one more. I think one of them opened. Because if, if memory serves me, it's Friday at 1 p.m. is now open. And that was not previously open. So if you've been wanting to spend an hour with the Lord, there is one hour that nobody is committed to. And then there are many, many, many hours. Of, there's over 10, maybe uh, 20 hours where the person who is committed to that hour is somebody who is actually taking on a second or even third hour. Um, so if you've been wanting to spend an hour with the Lord, uh, we have some hours available. It's just one hour a week. If you would like to spend some time with the Lord, come and volunteer in our Adoration Chapel. It will help your spiritual life. It will help you grow closer to Jesus. It will help you in ways that you probably won't be able to fully even experience or understand until a long time from now. That completes our weekly update. All those things you can find on our weekly update page on our website. This week in the Sunday readings, we will hear the following from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, what will separate us from the love of Christ? Will anguish or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? No, in all these things we conquer overwhelmingly through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor present things, nor future things, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I, I, in, in the grand scheme of the, the theology of St. Paul, I don't know how important this passage is. I know me. And this passage was incredibly important for me in my time in forming in the seminary. You know, it's, I've, I've read the whole New Testament multiple times. Once because I chose to, and then several times after that because I was told, you need to go read this, and, and I read it. Uh, this section from St. Paul had new meaning for me as I started to learn, uh, learn things. Obviously, there's a teaching in here from St. Paul about the power of God. That once God has chosen to take somebody to himself, there is nothing powerful enough. There's nothing more powerful than God. There's nothing that can knock us out of the hands of the Lord. But there's a second way to interpret this passage that I think provides a, a meaningful and interesting and cool way, a cool thing to talk about. And that is the permanence of the sacrament of baptism. You can in, in, in the Catholic Church, in, in the Catholic religion, you can only get baptized one time. And in fact, long ago, in the, in the age of St. Augustine, in the period of the church fathers, in those first three or four hundred years of the church, there were splits in the church on ideological grounds. So there's a very famous heresy. The Arian heresy proclaims that Jesus is a creature of the Father, is a creation of the Father, not the the actual Son of God, and that Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, is less than God, still very powerful, still very important, still the thing that saves us, but is not God. And of course, there, there was the Orthodox Christian understanding that Jesus was definitely God. So what, what ended up happening is, that's a theological debate happening at higher levels, and then there were people that just want to go to church on Sunday, like they just want to follow Jesus. And there were people that were raised by maybe their parents who believed the Arians or their parents who believe the Orthodox. And what would happen is w there was a big question. What do you do when you reconcile these communities when, when these people come back together? Do you need to rebaptize the people that were baptized by the heretics? And that question was answered with no. Because God is so powerful that he can still work the power of the sacraments, even for those who are not in communion with his church. And then secondarily, particularly baptism, and then included in that is also confirmation and holy orders, are irrepeatable because they leave a mark on the soul. Likewise, marriage is irrepeatable because it creates a link between two people that can't be dissolved except by death. And of course, when it's dissolved by death or prove that it was never formed, those persons can be remarried, but not so with the baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. Permanent mark. 
St. Augustine writes pages and pages and pages on this. Let's look at what St. Paul says. Powerful question. What will separate us from the love of God? Almost like he's saying, what are you afraid of? Well, he says, let me tell you what you're afraid of. Here's the things you're afraid of. Anguish, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, the sword. Seven things that you're afraid of. Now ask yourself again, what are you afraid of? What do you think can knock you out of the hand of the Lord? What do you think that God is not powerful enough to overcome? We can, we can change the words around and make it, maybe make it a little less fancy language, but a little easier to grasp. Anguish. Suffering. We're, we're afraid of suffering. Distress. We're afraid of danger. Persecution. I don't want to be attacked. I want my Christianity to be easy. Famine and nakedness or lack of just the goodness of the earth. Peril. Feels like distress. I don't know why St. Paul... I can't tell you why St. Paul used two words that mean almost the same thing. But then finally, the sword. And with the sword, I'm taking this to mean two different things. So there's two possibilities. One is like the the actual event that St. Paul happened to him was that the sword was the instrument of death. So that it was torture. Like I'm being persecuted because of my Christianity and the, the sword is actually being used against me. Or war. Do you think the danger of your death can knock you out of the hands of the Lord? Now, of course, St. Paul is asking a semi-rhetorical question. The answer to all of these is no. He, he, wouldn't have, he would have spent the rest of the chapter explaining why you should avoid these things because they can knock you out of the hands of the Lord. But his answer just to that is all, no, none of this, none of this. And then he moves on. In all these things, we conquer overwhelmingly through him who loved us. All of those things he just listed, we can beat all of them with the help of the Holy Spirit and the love of the Lord. For I am convinced, now St. Paul is saying, this is what I believe to be true, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, now, angels and principalities are two different choirs of, of spirits, of angels. If you if you look at the list of angels, principalities in there, nor present things, nor past things, nor powers, again, that's sort of his uh, double, double entendre innuendo, Powers is also a rank of, of the angels. Nor heights, nor depths, nor any other creature, now he's covered everything, will be able to separate us from the love of God. Nothing. What he said negatively before, he's now saying positively. Nothing can knock you out of the hand of the Lord. Now, like I said earlier, certainly St. Paul is saying something very powerful here about the power of God. That nothing is so powerful that it can knock you out of the hand of the Lord. There's nothing more powerful than God. God is not only all-powerful, but all-knowing. So even if something could separate us from God, God could easily find us again. It would not be a permanent separation. But there, I think there's something even stronger there. There's, not stronger. This is probably less important. The, the, the thing about the, the, the power of God, that is the important thing. That no matter what happens, you are still under the domain of God and God is protecting you. God can't lose you those things. But now there's a cool thing for our for our sacraments because now it's lived out in our sacramental realities. What can, not, what can separate you from the love of God? When we are baptized, we're given the mark of the Lord in baptism and it cannot be washed away by anything. You can't revoke your baptism. Well, I mean, obviously you can. You you can um, uh, un, unclaim, I guess. I don't know. I don't even know how to say it. You can choose to no longer associate with your baptismal faith. Sure. You can make public proclamation. I, re, I re, recant my baptism. However, it doesn't do anything. It's like saying, I don't believe in gravity. Well, you're still going to cling to the earth. It's not like you suddenly you said, close your eyes and change your mind. You're going to float away. No, there is certain reality that's happening. That baptismal mark cannot be removed. Now, it can be rendered unhelpful. It can be rendered useless, although it, it's kind of hard to say that it's ever actually useless, but where it's not actually giving us any grace. So if you recall, when Jesus meets the woman at the well, he says to her, if only you knew who was talking to you, you would ask them for a drink, him for a drink, and he would give you living water and it would well up from within you. Okay. Well, bap the mark of baptism is that source of grace within us. So that when we're baptized, that mark of baptism can become a source of grace for all of us, welling up from within us. Now, of course, you can cap a well. Now, we do this through our sin or neglect of our 
the the right religion due to God that we we don't pray we don't go to church we don't participate in any community we violate the commandments of the Lord particularly um, in choosing not to love the Lord or to love our neighbors so remember the two greatest commandments is to love the Lord your God with your whole heart mind and soul and to love your neighbor as yourself and if we're choosing not to do those things the love of God is no longer in us because it, it can't be seen it, it, it can't be experienced you can turn that off we can walk away from the Lord we can reject the Lord's gift of grace that he's given us. But here's the neat thing. We, what we can only do, all we can ever do, is turn that off in act, in actuality, what's being materialized. But the potential for the grace cannot be wiped away because the mark is still there. You know, it's like your faucet. You go to your bathroom. Your faucet's still there. It may not be giving you any water, but it's there. If you do the right things, of course, the faucet in your bathroom is not all that difficult to do. You just turn the knob and the grace comes out. But in in, in our interior spiritual life, you, you just, it, it's very easy. You just it, It's still there. It still has all the power that it's supposed to have. It's just not, it not, none of it's being used. So if we start to use it again, that spring flows freely again. Now, how do, you, how do you restore it once it's been shut off of you? Ask yourself, my life feels dry. I don't feel close to the Lord. I feel like I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. What, what can I do? Well, the answer is, is actually quite simple. And some, it's one of those things we, we tend to avoid. So you ask any of us here, you ask the, the 10, 9 to 10, or however many of us are, are here watching right now, what do you need to do to be healthy? I'm sure we could all populate a list of like 5 to 10 things that, we could do to be healthy and they would be things like drink more water eat good food eat a variety of food exercise read uh, socialize things you need to be healthy and we all know that and we all struggle with it it is difficult for all of us the same the same truth is 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 prevalent in the spiritual reality what are the things you need to to get the baptismal mark uh character flowing grace again live the life of the sacraments that, that would be the primary thing. Go, go get more grace. Secondary to that would be the, the preconditions for developing the virtues of Christian life. And, and this part is the thing that we would all know. Pray, read the scriptures, go to Sunday Mass, socialize with other people, read spiritual books outside of the liturgy, uh, get educated on the, th the good things of theology. There's a ton of free resources. All of those things will make you more disposed to receiving the grace that is gotten by going and living the sacramental life of the church. Go to confession. Go to mass. Commit to the prayer and life of the church. And uh, that sacramental character will be like brand new. You ever watched any of these restoration shows? the last 15 minutes before we started, I started watching a, a watch restoration show, which I'm sure sounds incredibly boring, but the, uh, the, the commentator, the person who's actually restoring the watch, um, I know from some other things and I, I know him to be able to make interesting, even not the most interesting things in the world. We watch those restorations and you have something that looks, Oh God, it looks terrible. It's not working. You do a little bit, of, but the master does a little bit of work on it. And all of a sudden, all the gook that was inside and was making it not work well is now gone. And now it can be restored to, to, to good functioning capacity. You watch any of the restoration shows. That's what you'll see. Our spiritual character is the same way. It's still there. It, it, it may just, it, it just shut off. And if we reactivate it and make use of it, it'll come right back. Now, it may stretch you. You know, you know, you wake up in the morning, you take a deep breath and, ooh, like my lungs hurt. Because what's well, because during the night, I, I wasn't breathing as deeply as I do during the day. And I'm just, uh, I, I need to get moving and stretch all that out again. And I get back to full capacity. So, the mark of baptism, the effect of baptism is permanent and is a source of grace for us. And we hear this in the writings of St. Paul today. Uh, people often express concern for those who do not have an opportunity for baptism. Would you discuss that for a little bit? Um, I do not think it is possible for me to talk about that for a little bit because 
there's about four or five topics actually under that particular question, but I'm going to give my best crack at it. Okay. So, uh, concern for those who have died without the opportunity of birth baptism. Here's the issue. There's actually about four or five different scenarios that all have different conclusions. So the first century, there was the problem of um, people were not just admitted into the Catholic faith. Adults were just like the current RCIA. They were in, they were educated in the faith so they could come to conversion. And then they received the faith at the Easter vigil from the bishop of their city. Excuse me. <clears throat> so what that meant was that there was this large swath of time between when they might start and when they might be uh, baptized. To which the Romans did not care if you were if you were unbaptized Christian, if you were following Jesus, you're all in the group. Okay. Well, so what happens to those who are committed to Christianity but have died without the benefit of baptism? Of course, they could have had the opportunity to be baptized as they were dying. That would be allowed. That's if you could do that without the Romans also killing you. That would be something bad. You would want to avoid that. So the teaching of the church there is that there is a baptism by desire. That the person who is is in the body of elect moving towards baptism as adults that dies, uh, there is a baptism by desire. So catechumens have the right to a Christian burial and would be buried with different rituals than uh, a non-catechumen. Okay. A unbaptized person who is who is being initiated into the church, who dies by way of martyrdom, becomes a full martyr in the Catholic Church. They, they, that would be the baptism by blood. So if you think about this, uh, my example was, was not great because a lot of those early, the exact example I'd use is actually the baptism in blood. Baptism in blood is somebody who is following Jesus but is not yet baptized, but gets killed for the faith. They receive... The, they're martyred. They, they're martyred, uh, pure and simple. Um, and they would be treated as fully initiated, baptized martyrs in the faith. A baptism by desire would be you're moving along and getting ready for baptism. And suddenly you have a massive heart attack and die right, on, right away. And nobody's able to get there and baptize you. And, and maybe we don't think about it or, or what, whatever happens. That would be baptism by desire. There was manifest desire to be baptized, but for whatever reason, we were not able to do the things to get to get you baptized. So what, you, what about those who don't have the opportunity for baptism, weren't seeking it, didn't die by martyrdom? Well, a- adults in that circumstance, would that's the majority of the non-Christian world. They, they, they're not seeking baptism. And they died without baptism. There's still hope for those people, but that hope is comes from the prayers and activity of the church. So that regardless of what happens, they are being saved. They can't if they are being saved, they're being saved by the activity of the church. But this would be <clears throat> men of men and women of goodwill who are sincerely seeking to do the good and sort of follow the Lord. Uh, I don't want to say passively, but like without explicit knowledge. Uh, that is not the easy way. That is very much the hard way. And we, we would still want to evangelize those people because Christ is the easy way. Explicit knowledge of Christ is the only way we know how to enter into heaven. Okay, so that's adults. Now we have children. That's, that's a whole other category and extremely painful. So we have a, a, a child who is um, born but and set for baptism, but then falls ill. Now, what all Catholics should know is that in danger of death, everybody can baptize. Anybody that can speak the words and pour the water or some combination of that with another person can baptize a person who is dying. Adult, child, in between, whatever. All you have to do is know that you pour water on the person and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Holy Spirit. Not that. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that person is baptized. Now, if they recover from, say they were ill, they recover from the illness, they would need to contact their local Catholic church. If they're conscious, you should ask them, um, and they should willingly commit. Um, 
there is a gray area around a person who is unconscious and you can't um, ascertain whether or not they had clear desire to be baptized. So I'm not going to touch that with a 10 foot pole right now because that is a raging debate amongst people far smarter than I. And now is not the time or place. The, the much more painful scenario is what happens to children who die without baptism, <clears throat> primarily because they died before they were born. So St. Thomas, surprisingly enough, answers this question that you cannot, so somebody's asked me, you can't, can you baptize a child in utero? And the answer is no. And St. Thomas's answer, uh, although I've never read in any explicit official answer from the Catholic Church, so maybe there is a different answer, but St. Thomas's answer is that it has to be a physical action, that you, you actually have to be able to pour the water on the person. And there's no way to do that uh, in utero for that child. So the, our response, Bonds to that is hope. There's a Vatican document on the, the, it's been a few years since I've read it. I want to say it's the, the fate of those children who die without baptism or something like that. It's very strangely titled document, but it focuses on, yes, while we don't know how one is saved without the use of the sacraments, we do believe that God is trusting and that God is loving and powerful and desires all to be saved and be with him forever in paradise. There have been some traditional answers to this. So what happens to a child who dies without baptism? <clears throat> you can make a admittedly speculative. So this is speculation. You could make an argument that is not too strange that the children of Christians who desire to have their children baptized, who die without baptism, may qualify for the baptism of desire because it, it, it sort of fits all the other, all these superficial qualities of this. So I desire, there is a desire to have the person baptized. The person is not baptized because of some external circumstance that was not foreseen. And the, but, but it was fully expected that that person would be baptized. So you can make a case for that. I wouldn't rely on that, but you can make a case for that. There's also a case to be made that those children who are killed by abortion um, or witnessing to a or are being killed or sacrificed because of a great evil. So if you look at, say, the, the Feast of the Holy Innocents, all the children that were murdered um, because of the birth of Jesus, you know, uh, when the uh, not the rabbis, but the uh, Magi go to Herod and tell them about the, the, uh, the child. And they don't come back. Herod flies into a rage, which he's known for, and uh, has all the children, two or less, killed in Bethlehem, which, of course, that was the age range that Jesus would have been in. All of those children are remembered and recalled in the Feast of the Holy Innocents because they died protecting the Messiah. There, there, there's something there that these children are almost been sacrificed. The, 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 the children who have died in abortion may have been sort of sacrificed and there is a, a, some people make an argument for a baptism by blood again that that's probably a little more a stretch even for the, uh, compared to the baptism by desire um, that I used with the parents of children who died before they could be baptized um, what the other major answers are if you look in the writings of St. Augustine he talks about a, a space um, in hell without the suffering where they would simply not know that they were in paradise, but they would not suffer the fires, the, the, the torments of hell. Dante, in his, uh, it's either Paradisum or uh, Purgatorio. Everybody's familiar with the, with the uh, Inferno, the first book of his Divine Comedy, which is a three, three book series. In, in there, in, somewhere in between, the, the second and the third book, he talks about an earthly paradise that the saints have to pass through before they enter into heaven. And it's the space where they're allowed to become detached from earthly created goods so that they can enter into the more spiritual realm of heaven. Because when they see God face to face, the, those attachments are either going to be painfully burned away, just like they did in purgatory, uh, but they're, they're going to be left behind anyway. So leave, leave it behind here. Now I've never read the, the divine comedy, but I've listened to a lot of, a lot of talks on it and this is what I ascertained from it but it also uh, it might also be that, that that's Dante's answer for those who are men and women of goodwill who die without baptism they, and they, they live in the earthly paradise and certainly don't have access to the full glory of heaven they don't have the divine uh, they don't have the 
a beatific vision. They don't see God face to face, but they receive all of the blessings of this life and can live in, in perfection. Uh, I, I would, I would be hesitant to commit to either of those two theories when the official teaching of the church is something uh, admittedly less satisfying and but a lot less speculative which is we know the only way that we know how to be saved is through baptism and life in the church uh, we know that God is not limited to his power so he can save people without the access to the church there is great room for hope that those children who die without baptism are in paradise and that we should pray for them that, 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 and that should rub us like that is not I mean that's a correct answer but it's not a satisfying answer but that don't let that rub result in frustration but instead um, oh shoot uh, urgency that it's urgent with urgency we need to pray for uh, those children who die without baptism um, because we can really help them in their judgment whatever that looks like that again what, what that last part looks like when we when we get past the veil of this life is beyond my beyond what we are capable of knowing and certainly beyond my understanding in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen good and loving god we thank you for the grace that you have given us to be worthy recipients of your baptism and your adoption we ask you lord as we move forward towards this weekend that you would prepare our hearts to receive your grace and to be ready to receive whatever special thing you have for us this weekend so that we can draw closer to yourself lord please bring a swift end to the coronavirus please protect us from storms and hurricanes especially the one that's heading towards south of we that's heading towards florida right now lord um, send us refreshed and renewed vocations to the priesthood, to the consecrated religious life, and for more holy marriages. We ask you, Lord, that you would give renewed unity to our nation. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Almighty God bless you, the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So uh, it was a pleasure talking with you guys this evening. You guys have a nice evening and we will see you either this weekend or next week. Peace.